Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia, and I'm also currently a Danish Diabetes and Endocrine Academy Visiting Professor at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. The idea behind Inside Exercise is to bring to you the absolute who's who of exercise research. So exercise physiology, exercise metabolism, and exercise and health. And what I'm wanting is for you to get your information from the research experts in exercise rather than from influencers. And indeed, today I bring to you Professor Mike Tipton from the University of Portsmouth in England. He is an absolute authority on exercise in extreme environments, especially cold. So we talked a lot about what happens if you fall or you jump into cold, very cold water, what sort of responses you have and how you can end up getting into trouble very quickly for reasons other than just the drop in body temperature. We also talked about other factors to do with cold, so exercise in the cold generally, uh, whether it's smart to try and cool your body before exercise using ice vests, for example. He's an absolute wealth of knowledge. I found it really, really interesting. I think you will too, so stick around. Hi, Mike. Thank you for coming on at late notice. Um, I was planning to have you uh, uh, 8th of August or something, and uh, we had a, a bit of a scheduling change, and you popped in, I think, two or three hours later. So thank you very much for that. Pleasure. Um, it's nice to be with you, Glenn. Oh, thank you. All right. So we're going to be talking about, so you're, you know, you're an extreme uh, environments researcher, especially cold, but you've done hot stuff as well. Um, but I, I actually think even before we talk about exercise and the cold um, and, and maybe some exercise in the heat, and I know you've done some altitude stuff, et cetera. I reckon it's really interesting, the stuff you've done for many years. I think you had 1999 Lancet paper, and for people that don't know, in a, in a very strong journal. But talking about how, you know, people can fall into the water. It's not so bad, where, you know, I'm from Australia originally, if you fall in the water there. But um, you were saying something like between one and 2,000 people or something die a year around the cold waters around Britain. Um, so why don't you just talk about that a little bit? What I was amazed by is I just assumed people got hypothermia and, and, and died, but you were saying that there's other things going on as well. Yeah, sure. So um, there's about a thousand deaths a day worldwide. Uh, so um, drowning is the second or third most common cause of accidental death in most countries. In the UK, it's around about um, 400. Um, so it's one about every 20 odd hours, uh, one child a week. And historically, much like your perception, Glenn, the idea was that, you know, people fell into cold water and they died from hypothermia. And that that belief started with the Titanic, where actually a lot of people did die from hypothermia. It was icy, calm water um, they, and people had life jackets on. And that was reinforced in the Second World War, where people died in water hanging on to floats. Um, however, in 1977, there was a Home Office report published where it revealed that um, about two thirds of those that die were regarded as good swimmers and they were dying within about two or three metres of a safe refuge. Now, a good swimmer doesn't die um, in, two, you know, in, in the short period of time that it takes to travel two or three metres from hypothermia. An adult human being is unlikely to become hypothermic in less than 30 minutes because we're just simply too big have too much heat you can't take the heat out quick enough so that suggested to us that something much more rapid was occurring the first mention of um, <clears throat> an increase in the respiratory response and heart rate response to immersion in cold water was really just as an ac academic footnote back in about 1884 um, and so um, we started to think, well, you know, what's happening? So we, we did some studies. Um, we did some investigation of fatal accident inquiries and we looked at the stats. And it was quite clear that um, when you take somebody and you drop them into cold water, the skin temperature changes very rapidly. That stimulates the cold receptors that are about 0.18 millimetres below the surface of the skin. There's an enormous afferent discharge that then directly stimulates um, the respiratory centers and the cardiac centers. So you see a gasp of two to three liters and, mm -hmm. um, and that followed by uncontrollable hyperventilation and an increase in cardiac output, an increase in blood pressure because the body shuts down blood to the periphery. So this combination of a cardiorespiratory response um, 
seemed like it was you know the primary problem and we we gave it the term cold shock not because of the medical definition of shock but just simply because it's a shocking thing to happen and people find mm. going into I mean, most people know this if they go into water they thought was warm and it was cold or a shower runs cold or something like okay. that um but the, sorry can the, i can i yeah so can i just ask is that is that if someone like falls in unexpectedly and they go oh, you know get this sudden shock or whatever or if you yeah. think oh, i'm going to do a bit of Bo um, bornhoff and, and I'd jump in there and you know and we have in australia the icebergs like people that purposely jump into freezing cold water yeah does it is it happening when it's an unexpected thing or is it is it is it this physiology just turns on no matter what now the physiology turns on no matter what um about half of those who end up in cold water in the uk had no intention of going in so mm -hmm. you know that's their slip trips and falls um if you go in, I mean, if you know you're going in and you go in slowly, then you get a smaller cold shock response because it shows both spatial and temporal summation. So the faster the, the rate of change of skin temperature up to a maximum and the bigger the surface area, the bigger the response. Um, and um, the other side of that is that it very quickly habituates. So as, as few as six three minute immersions in cold water, you can halve the size of the cold shock response. The most dangerous mm. response associated with going in cold water for the majority of individuals, fit, healthy individuals, is the loss of the control of breathing, the inability to breath hold and the uncontrollable hyperventilation. The gasp response on initial immersion is between two and three litres. The lethal dose of water into the lung, salt water, is about one and a half litres for a, an average individual. So even the very first breath in, if it happens to be you've fallen from a height or you've dived in or water splashing on the face, can cross the lethal dose for drowning. So, um, but like all receptors, the cold receptors will have a big dynamic response that drives this, the cold shock response we've talked about, but then adapts to the new environment. And so after about a minute, you begin to get your breathing back under control. And so actually critical to survival is what you do in that first minute when you've lost control of your breathing and um <clears throat> what we have had advocated now for many years is that the first thing you do is as little as possible you try and avoid the urge to thrash about to swim to wave your arms um, and you stay as still as possible and we call it and um, float to live and that's the basis of the royal national lifeboat institution in the uk's campaign um, for which is a big public health campaign for surviving the initial period of immersion. Um, you can go online, you can see lots of stuff on it. I, I've now seen it um, repeated in Australia as float to survive in New Zealand. So it's just this idea of keeping your airway clear of the water and resting until you get your breathing back under control and neurophysiological response to cold um, adapts. So you're saying, so if someone falls in an accident, I mean, it's, it's probably more easy to sort of control if you um, get in knowingly. But if you're saying if someone falls in, they're sort of going to panic. But you're saying you, if they've heard this concept of staying float to survive, you're saying that that would help a lot with, but, 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 but would it stop the, the sudden gasp or? No, uh, no, it doesn't stop the, uh, it doesn't stop the gasp, but it means that you've got, uh, um, much less chance of that gas being underwater. Um, and we first, the first study we did on this was 1986, I think it was, where we had people go into cold water and swim immediately, as opposed to hang on to the side for a couple of minutes. It's published in the mm -hmm. Journal of Physiology if people want to follow it up. And those, once they'd held on to the side for a couple of minutes and got their breathing under control, everyone was successful in swimming for 10 minutes in very cold water. And those that shot off straight away, about half of them failed. And it was simply because it's really hard to coordinate your breathing um, when, you're, when you've got a respiratory rate, which is about 66 breaths per minute. You're shifting 114 litres in and out of the lung uncontrollably. Now try and add a swim stroke to that. Okay. It's funny. It must be, is there a certain temperature? Because I know straight away I'd pictured that, that you, you jump in and it's cold and you start swimming straight away. But you're saying if it's, if it's colder than that, that won't happen because you know obviously you wouldn't tend to have the, the uncontrollable breathing as well. Yeah. So is there a certain temperature where that tends to happen? Uh, yeah, the, the cold shock response 
um, in a poorly protected individual wearing normal clothing um, peaks somewhere between 15 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. Um, and so, you know, somewhere in there, you're going to get the maximum response. As water temperature goes below 10 degrees, you still get the maximum physiological response, but the sensation changes from one of cold to one of pain because below about mm. five degrees Celsius, it's cold nociceptors that fire rather than uh, in addition to cold receptors. So actually five degrees and below feels painfully cold, um, uh, okay. but it doesn't change your, it doesn't change your physiological response. So you're saying the cold receptors and then the nociceptors, nociceptors are the pain. So you're saying you've got the cold receptors, because I always remember saying any receptor will be painful if you're stimulated enough. But you're saying you've got cold receptors and you've got your plain pain receptors, or are they cold yeah. pain receptors? What are they? Yeah, you've got different populations of cold receptors. So you've got quite a lot fire um, of your cold receptors in the skin fire at around about 25 degrees Celsius, quite high. Um, but mm -hmm. that's, you know, we're a tropical animal. We want to be naked in... 26 to 28 degree air and as that air temperature falls we start to defend that temperature by vasoconstriction so we've got quite a lot of afferent input um, in the mid to low 20s um, <clears throat> the maximum output from that those receptors um, is evoked as i say in water between 15 and 10 but it's kind of important to remember that you know, there's a very significant difference between cold air and cold water, just because of the physics of the two fluids. Cold water, mm -hmm. 25 times the thermal conductivity, you know, a, a, a much greater uh, 4,000 times the volumetric specific heat. So cold water will cool you much more effectively and continue to cool you without itself warming up. Uh, and what that means is um, some of the responses are the same. Um, longer term exposure, you'll see the same kind of physical incapacitation in air and cold water, but it'll occur much more quickly in water. Mm -hmm. But there are some responses like the cold shock response that you just don't see in air because you can't cool the skin quick enough. Right. And is that another reason to stay still? Because, you know, you get that boundary layer. You know, if you put your, you've hurt your ankle and you put it in nice cold water, if, it st if you stay still, it doesn't feel that cold after a while. But if you keep stirring it around, it feels cold because you're moving that sort of boundary layer that warms up. Is that another reason not to thrash around that you, you'd you actually warm the water slightly? Or? It is in the longer term, not so much in the short term, because in the short term, you've probably stirred the water fairly significantly by falling into it or by running into it or tripping into it. Yes. But certainly, um, you know, and particularly if you've got even any kind of clothing on, staying still is beneficial because exactly that, you can trap some heat next to the skin, the boundary layer, that you don't, mm. don't then disturb. And <clears throat> Bill Keating did some experiments a long while ago showing that if you're in water below 25 degrees Celsius, you actually stay warmer if you stay still than if you exercise. Um, and of mm. course, that's that's counterintuitive to people who are used to what happens in air, because, of course, if you exercise in air, you just get warmer than if you stay still. But in water, once the water temperature drops below about 25, then stirring the water by exercising one destroys your boundary layer increases your convective heat loss sends blood that's been removed from the limbs because by vasoconstriction to conserve heat uh, pulling it back below the subcutaneous fat that's got the same thermal characteristics as cork you now exercise and you send blood into the working muscles which destroys that in that that unperfused muscle insulation that gives you about 70 percent of your total body insulation um, and you send blood into the limbs, perfectly designed for losing heat, high surface area to mass ratio. Mm -hmm. And so you cool more quickly. And we did a few experiments that showed actually, if you have to exercise in, in water that's colder than 25, leg only exercise is the thing to do because, you know, the, the, the chief culprits in terms of losing heat with exercise are the arms. Um, because the other thing that happens when you exercise the arms, they no longer insulate the torso because you've now moved them away from the torso, you're stirring, they've got a higher surface area to mass ratio, shorter conductive pathway from the center of the arm to the surface. So the arms are particularly susceptible to cooling. Okay, so if you fall in, you're better off treading, because you know when you tread water, <laughs> it's mainly the legs anyway, but you tend to move your legs and your arms, you're better off just moving your legs. I guess. Well, it's interesting because 
when you ask people, can you float? They'll all say I'll just float. No, no, or they'll say a bit, maybe. Um, <clears throat> in fact, in fact, people can float um, pretty much. Uh, all women can float and uh, most males with about three to five percent of the body surface area above at the surface of the water above the water. And it's a really good idea if that three to five percent is the airway and not your hand waving because you can't breathe mm -hmm. through that. And so another reason for saying still, um, if you lean back, put your ears in the water, um, you know, have a breath, you know, you'll be breathing away in your chest. You have quite a lot of air in your chest, so that'll help. And do as little sculling movement as possible. Then that'll get you through that first minute. And the, the r and I have been using, you know, this basic physiology as the center of their um, Respect the Water campaign, Float to Live campaign since 2014. And people can go online and see the fantastic adverts. I mean, one of the nice things about what we do is we're investigating the basic physiology. I mean, sometimes down to the cellular level in terms of we mentioned heat shock proteins. Um, <clears throat> but um, at the other end of that continuum, we're working with external groups such as the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, Surf Life Saving GB, the Coast Guard, to ensure that those that science gets translated into, into public health messaging, search and rescue techniques. And that's a really rewarding thing to do as a scientist. Well, I meant to actually say all that at the uh, introduction, I forgot. I was going to say you've done 40 years of, of research around this, this area, but you've translating. So you, you're... I think it said you are a lifetime member of the Royal Life Saving, something like that. You've been involved in all sorts of reports and, and actually translating yeah. it. And, and, you know, on, on I, I think for any, yeah, I mean, I think for any budding scientists um, that are working in an area where there's, I mean, all science is applicable. I mean, there's no, you know, I agree with the, the, the Peter Medwa, um you know a quotation that you know there is no such thing as pure and applied science there's just good and bad because everyone's applying their science one way and another and um we're lucky in that we have groups there that are interested in what we do and want to apply it so that might be the fire and rescue service it might be the coast guard the rli all these different groups and what happens within time is you end up getting becoming part of those groups because they invite you onto committees so I sit as a, a council member of the RNLI. I was a director of Surf Life Saving. I sit on committees with the Coast Guard. Uh, and that's a really important way of helping translate your research, your laboratory research into you know, you know, practical outcome, whether that be a search and rescue technique or resuscitation technique, whether that be a way of staying alive. I call it from lab to life saving. And I think what we sometimes undervalue as scientists is the importance of that link with the end users of our research and also um, the importance of publishing in the grey literature because I as you mentioned we've published in the Lancet we've published in the Journal of Physiology we've published in some of these erudite um, <clears throat> scientific journals but actually I suspect that more people um, have read the stuff we've written in Rescue magazine or in the RNLI magazine that actually have then that's helped implement that stuff. So we we need to value that grey literature and getting our message to the end users of our applied research um, more than we do, I think. And actually, you're doing that at the moment anyway, coming on the podcast a little bit. So yeah, it was interesting when when before I started the podcast, I'd be applying for grants and it would say, how are you translating? And it, it would be almost like a little, little bit of lip service, to be honest. But then, um, you know, just sort of say, oh, I've been on this show and I've written this article. But but, you know, not really applying it greatly. And I found doing this podcast is, is really great to get it out, get it yeah. get it out there to people more. And you've obviously been doing that. And actually, we just had, I'm in Copenhagen for four and a, five and a half months, and we just had this, like, um, PhD conference. One of the students came up and said how great it was we heard, he heard the podcast with David Costell. David Costell was saying right from the start, back in the 60s, Whenever he'd do a study, he'd go and write it up for Runner's World or whatever mm -hmm. and actually put it out there, apply it. Mm -hmm. And that really um, excited the students. said, oh, that's it. I'm going to do that <coughs> with my research. I'm not just going to, you know, sit in the ivory tower or whatever. You know, just, I'm not just going to do the research. I'm going to make sure people know about it. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely uh, yeah. agree with that. Um, 
the other the other aspect of this is um, using the media. So it's you know we've talked about the grey literature, but there's um, an increasing appetite in the media for science, um, and the relationship between science and the media has improved no end over the forty years that I've been working. Uh, where in forty years ago, you were almost ostracised as a scientist if you got in touch with the media and got involved with the media. But now people recognize the importance of getting the public to understand the importance of what scientists are doing and also to educate them in the, in the ways that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I can get the BBC to come and film something we do or to interview me, and I probably do an in, on average an interview a week or two on some aspect mm -hmm. of climate change, heat, cold, you know, just in the last few weeks, as you can imagine, it's been you know, uh, the sad incident of the submarine, we've had heat waves, we've had, uh, you know, um, people getting involved in cold water immersions for health. But if I speak to the BBC, that's going to be easily, in some instances, half a million to two million people that may listen to that, depending on the outlet. Mm. I, I guarantee all of my publications added up haven't come to half mm. a million readers. So, mm. uh, you know, I think it's really important. And the other side of that, or, you know, an extension of that is that when we're being assessed in the UK under the research excellence framework, there is now not just lip service, but a proper assessment of the impact of the work that you're doing uh, and how that's impacting on society and what it's changed and the evidence for that change. So, you know, there's lots and lots of good reasons for doing things like this podcast and engaging with the media and publishing in the grey literature. Oh, good on you. Yeah, I remember it used to be they say, what's your impact? And I say, well, the impact factor of that paper was whatever. <laughs> it's like, no, no. Mm -hmm. All right. So getting one thing I wanted to, I was thinking about earlier when you said about having a close on, um, I guess if I fell in water and I survived the initial panic and whatever else, I'd be a bit confused because, you know, the, the clothes get waterlogged and get heavy and it's hard to swim and things, but they're trapping, um, you know, what warm, potentially some warm air from your body. What, what's the what's the idea around that? Is is it is it worse to fall in water naked or dressed? <clears throat> should you should you take the clothes off or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, again, back to people's perception. Most people think they can't float when they can, and most people think that clothes drag them down when they don't. Um, okay. What so what clothes do is um, yes, they absolutely impede you if you try and swim you know waterlogged clothing minimize minimizes flexibility and you know your ability to swim however we've just discussed the fact that if you're in cold water you shouldn't swim anyway um That's and if true. you stay I still keep going back to that story i, should, I could yeah, I, yeah. i'm losing your message because i keep talking about treading water and things when you've been trying to yeah. say stay, stay still, still. So. and the clothing will help for two reasons one um provided you stay still if, if you swim you'll get exhausted very quickly wearing clothing but if you stay still the air trapped in the different layers of clothing will help you stay afloat uh, and also it'll minimize heat exchange at the skin uh, and so you'll have that opportunity of building up a, a boundary layer that will insulate you so um and in situations of high heat loss in fact griff pew showed this many years ago with lanolin and open water swimmers spreading you know a wool fat on themselves that in situations of very high heat flow small changes in insulation can support quite a big difference between core and skin temperature um, and and so it's you know any small amount of insulation you can gain in a situation of high heat loss is potentially beneficial okay now you said something at the start about uh i, I may have got it wrong but something about most people that fall in the water and get into difficulty only actually die are only like two or three meters from the shore. Um, would you still say, because it just almost seems counterintuitive that two or three meters away, it's like six or seven feet, uh, 10 feet for the Americans, um, that you wouldn't just swim over there. Yeah, um, no, no. Well, so um, if you, um, go into cold water and you gasp and you aspirate water, um, mm. uh, you, you've probably got less than 70 to 75 seconds of, of, of consciousness. Uh, 
and towards the end of that it will be impaired consciousness um uh, in fact we just we've published a paper for various reasons um, recently called the experience of drowning and it was really aimed at medical legal cases that actually debate this kind of issue you know how long does it take to drown how long are you conscious what's mm-hmm. it feel like um, <clears throat> so you don't have that long and you're incapacitated fairly quickly. So, you know, you may well be able to get a few feet, but by then you're going to be so preoccupied with the burning, tearing sensation of water going into the lung. The cough reflex has also therefore been initiated that the idea that you're going to swim, you know, uh, with a perfect stroke for even two or three meters is, you know, um, you know, just not going to happen. So it, it, it is, I mean, it is possible to be really very quickly incapacitated. And that's why we do see so many people um, drowning within such a short distance of, of what would be regarded as a safe refuge. And I mean, that's just the respiratory side of things. What we haven't talked about is <clears throat> that, um, you know, for people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, aneurysms, hypertension, then that sudden increase in the workload of the heart can itself do things like rupture vessels, um, you know, cause heart attacks, um, so which are fairly quickly incapacitating. We also know that if you hold your breath and you go into cold water and you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response, where you're releasing lots of stress hormones, you're getting this big drive to breathe, this big um, um, in, input to the heart to increase the strength of contraction and the rate of contraction. But if you then act, get some water splashed on the face, you're now stimulating the ophthalmic division, the trigeminal nerve, and that will then try and slow the heart. And so that's the parasympathetic or the vagal side of the autonomic nervous system. And we found that even with young, fit, healthy individuals, if you ask them to breath hold um, as long as they can, which is something that you probably would be doing in that situation rather than aspirate water, and then you get water splashed on your face, which can happen very easily in open water um, situations, then that creates what we've called autonomic conflict. So it's a conflict between the sympathetic side of the nervous system, autonomic nervous system, trying to accelerate heart rate, and the parasympathetic trying to slow it down. And in, a, in 82, 83% of otherwise fit and healthy individuals, you've, you'll see some form of arrhythmia within about 10 seconds of breaking the breath hold. Now that's okay, but it's a remarkably reproducible way of producing an arrhythmia in individuals. And if those individuals happen to have predisposing factors such as long QT syndrome, such as um, channel opathies, um, you know, cardiovascular disease, then the chances of that, those arrhythmias, which are mostly supraventricular, but occasionally ventricular, descending into something more serious um, is is pretty high. And so um, we know, for example, that um, 80% of those people who who die in triathlons die in the swim phase, and they die fairly soon in the swim phase. And these are people who are fit, They've trained. It's not like the first time they've been in water. So the question is, what is it about doing the triathlon that causes these deaths? And we think it's autonomic conflict. And we think it's caused by the fact that anybody who's done a mass start in a triathlon will know that it's a bit like diving into a washing machine. And so you start Mm. swimming, you turn to breathe and you can't. You extend your breath hold time. Your sympathetic nervous system is up. You're probably a bit angry uh, as well as a bit excited. And we think that probably that's enough to evoke an autonomic conflict that then results in a cardiac problem, often not picked up at post-mortem because it's an electrical electrical disturbance of the heart and the end point of which is agonal gasping and water goes into the lung. So it looks very like drowning and you won't see a problem with the heart at post-mortem. Um, and there are things you can do if you're involved in organizing um, open water swimming events to minimize the chance of that happening. It tends to happen with mass starts. It tends to happen where people come together at buoys to two turns where they start swimming all over each other. So having, um, you know, your start in waves, having a long distance before you get people to turn so that they're spread out a bit, just to avoid this, you know, coming together and unnecessary extension of breath holding and aggravation. 
Um, it's cold water, it's cold water stimulation, cold shock, and and what is essentially the diving response, the uh, vagal response, at the same time is is potentially a very dangerous thing to happen. Interestingly, cold water does it, and the other thing that does it is anger. So if you're both open water swimming and angry, you've got a, got a bit of a double whammy. And we think the reason people don't see it in training is because when they're training, they're just breathing freely. They're not getting aggravated. They're not. They haven't got um, a sympathetic overdrive running. So it's it's much safer. Wow. Okay. There's a lot there to sort of unpack. Just trying to get my head around the the autonomic conflict. So you're saying you got the sympathetic um, outflow. So so even just the normal sympathetic, not not the the sudden. Um, so if you're doing a triathlon, just the normal sort of sympathetic, excited for swimming. Um, and it's normal to have your you know, adrenaline and everything up to, to, you know, as you said, for contraction of the heart and dilate yeah. your eyes and everything. But then you say, what, you get a splash of water beyond just getting wet. So you might sit up, you might go to take a breath and you get a splash of water and that causes the diving, <coughs> the, the slowing of the heart. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I th we think you're right in that it doesn't have to be cold shock although you're going to get a bit of that going into even, you know, tepid water, even with a, 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 um, a wet, shorty wetsuit on or a race suit on. But actually what you've mostly got is exercise and excitement driving your sympathetic response. Mm -hmm. um, the, the important point to make is that um, if you're breathing freely, we see, you know, so every breath you're breathing, we don't tend to see that conflict. Where we tend to see it, is with an extended breath hold. So if we get people to normally, if we do a head out immersion in cold water in the laboratory, in young, fit, healthy individuals, we might see an incidence of an arrhythmia one to three percent max, and that'll be you know pretty innocuous. If we um, add, do we still do a head out immersion, but we add a maximum breath hold time to that, that tends to increase the number of arrhythmias we see. And if we do that breath hold underwater. And then they break their breath hold, um, then it'll go up to this 83%. So I, I think it's probably now people are swimming freestyle, so they've got their face in the water anyway. So I think it's more to do with the extended breath holding that goes on when you turn to breathe and you can't because there's a plume of water on your face from the guy next to you than it, than it is from because you're getting okay. the face stimulus and the, and the, um, and the, Coach, you know the sympathetic drive anyway i mean we've had we've had incidents where people have said oh you know there's um we were doing a, an open water drill and we got the guys to swim out to a dummy 100 meters offshore and the two guys that had the problem were the guys that decided it would be quicker if they didn't breathe every stroke um so there's something very sinister about you know ex having an extended breath hold time in amongst this it's actually interesting because I'm getting sort of flashbacks now because I was always a distance runner, but I get injured and I started doing triathlons, but I was a crap swimmer. And um, yeah, so I remember now I'd be swimming and people would just go over you um, like yeah. with their clenched clenched fist, just to sort of bang, bang, bang over you mm -hmm. to get past you. And, um, and, and you'd sort of go to take a breath and <gasps> you just get a bit of a fright because someone's splash water in your face and yeah. so then you you know you start panicking a bit and all that so is that is that potentially um what well, could be going on i mean my my know. experience of mass starts on like yours i guess is the first 100 meters is not swimming it's pulling on neoprene uh, which is what people do and yeah. and of course the other thing is that happens is sometimes you'll get somebody put their hand and they'll press your goggle into your eye that's a vagal stimulus um oh, just it? you know just taking a breath um, after a breath hold, you're reinstating a sort of sinus arrhythmia. And what we found with other work we've done um, on isolated hearts with colleagues at King's College, Mike Shattuck in particular, is that if you've got, a, you know, a, a vagal, varying vagal drive superimposed on a sympathetic drive, that's when you're most likely to see these arrhythmia. So that's what I was thinking as well. So just so people are on the same page, the vagal is the, the vagal nerve is sort of your parasympathetic, which is slowing the heart. And yeah. then you've got your sympathetic, which is increasing the heart. And I was actually vaguely thinking about that when you were talking, because these really well-trained endurance athletes are going to have a lot of vagal tone that's going to be like kind of slowing the heart at the same time that, that they've got the sympathetic anyway, you know what I mean? Because their heart rate's so slow. I wonder if that 
wonder if that sort of plays a role if they get a bit of extra dive reflex <clears throat> thrown in there. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. And we we think it may well do. I mean, we, you know, we all know of um, you know, there's a fairly significant incidence of sudden cardiac death in, in athletes. And um, you know, and there's lots of screening being introduced to try and reduce that. The question we've got um is what happened to provoke it on that day at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. and you know, and I, I think there may well be a role for this autonomic conflict. It's certainly now, I think it's probably applicable beyond the open water swimming or the cold water immersion um, scenario or arena. Um, and it may well be just something as simple as, you know, something that you've you know eaten to make your heart more uh, sensitive. The fact that there was a cold breeze blew across your face, you got angry about something. Um, so I don't know, you know, I, I suspect it, it may well have a role to play, uh, i.e. autonomic conflict in being the thing that triggers the, the problem. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite difficult to investigate that, of course. It would be. Um, it'd be hard to do research, just get people angry and get put them in the water and then <clears throat> splash water. Yeah, it'd be well, hard to control uh, these sort of things. Yeah, although if you go on a cardiac ward and you ask people what the last emotion they felt, they'll often report anger. And we know that mm -hmm. anger also provokes, um, you know, um, autonomic conflict in terms of um, coincidental stimulation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. I mean, we've got models where we can stimulate the sympathetic chain as well as the vagus, and you can play around with with, with the different inputs. And it and it definitely appears that you know if you if you start, you can titrate out this sympathetic background drive with with fluctuating vagal input is particularly good at producing arrhythmia. Yeah, it's interesting because I always tend to think you tend to think of you know parasympathetic and sympathetic separately, but not that they're working at the same time. But they obviously are because I, I remember also when you start exercise, you know, up to about I don't know if this is still what's believed, but just say your resting heart rate seventy or something start exercise at a lot of intensity up to about 100 beats per minute my understanding is it's removing the parasympathetic which is slowing your heart and then above about 100 beats a minute it's mainly increasing the sympathetic so they're obviously just working together the whole time which makes sense anyway yeah i mean i think um, the general the general perception is that that it's the yin and yang uh, where it becomes problematic is where it's the yin and yin uh where you know you've activated both sides but the take-home right. message for people involved in open water swimming is avoid protracted breath holds um, and if you're organizing an event just avoid m making people have to start climbing all over each other mm -hmm. and extending Great breath point. hold and get you know by mm -hmm. by the way you start the event by the way you get people to turn you can actually design a course that will minimize or maximize the likelihood of, of these problems occurring do you find the organisers take much notice of these things or are they more? Yeah. more um, no? I'm pleased to say they had. I mean, I did the, um, <clears throat> I did the, in Cash K, the Portuguese triathlon a couple of years ago. And I was really pleased that they actually set us off in waves of six. Instead of just saying to, you know, a thousand mm -hmm. people go, um, which I've been in triathlons where they've done that. And that, that is essentially pulling on neoprene for 100 or 200 metres. Um, they actually get, had us go off in in, in waves of six. Um, six and also time. there was quite a long swim parallel to the shore before there was any turn. So I didn't I didn't mm -hmm. have any coming together at any of the turns. And it was a much more enjoyable experience, as well as I suspect being much less hazardous in terms of a cardiac response. Are you saying six people at a time? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, there were just there were just six people. people, but I mean, there was a whole there was a, everyone lined up, you know, in in sixes, and they just went across the line, and they've got all the automatic timing chips now, wow. so it's not mm -hmm. beyond the wit of man to work out that you know that group of st six started twenty minutes after that group of six, so subtract twenty minutes. It's also naturally because I think about we've got this big city to serve running race in in, in um, Sydney, and you know they had different starts for people at different paces. So you'd want the same with the triathletes, I guess. You wouldn't want, even if you had six really slow ones, then the six yeah. fast ones have to swim over the top of them. <clears throat> uh, they do. So they do that. They put you in bins. So when you do the knee sign, man, mm -hmm. you're in a bin that, that 
that estimates your time to swim the 3.9 kilometer swim. However, uh, that doesn't really take much account of what people do the first two or 300 meters in, which is where That's all true. this it's is happening. Pacing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so we've touched on exercise and it's, <clears throat> it's been really interesting so far, but um, what about, you sent me a couple of dot points. So sudden death during swimming and triathlons. I guess we've talked about that. Is that actually sudden? What's the definition? I always think sudden just means you swing along and then boom, dead. Or are you what you're talking about as well is is defined as sudden death, where you yeah yeah I mean yeah. there's that as opposed to a, um, a, a a slow deterioration, which you might see with cooling in a cold environment and cold water due to cooling of the for example, you know the extremities. So after the cold shock response, when the skin is cooled and you've got all of those cardiorespiratory responses that abate within about a minute. So that's the neurophysiological equivalent of it's okay once you're in, which people always tell you. Um, the next tissues to cool are the superficial nerves and muscles. So the, all this is happening with a normal bo deep body temperature, but because of what we've talked about in terms of the arms, the high surface area to mass ratio, very superficially running muscles and nerves, you can very quickly um, lose physical capacity and become incapacitated in in cold water and what we see is even in really elite swimmers um a <clears throat> fairly quick progression from you know horizontal efficient length of stroke to more upright greater sinking force greater drag shorter um shorter stroke length more frequent strokes and then you end up in this sort of upright position where people end up doing what we call climbing the ladder they're actually starting to swim like this um, and and all you know that that in very cold water that can happen in as little as 10 15 minutes uh, so it depends on the temperature and it depends on the individual but that's what we would call short-term immersion problems which occur after the skin is cooled but long before the core temperature starts to cool and that's that would be a more slow um, deterioration in performance in fact we try and instruct those that are supervising events to recognize the progression of swim failure from you know um, a, a, a calm horizontal long stroke low frequency swim into a more upright or periodic stopping you know because if you can recognize that then you know you can stop this progressing into full-on swim failure <clears throat> actually that makes me think as well when you talk about arms because when you compare arms and legs during exercise with legs you don't get as much of an increase in blood pressure as with arms and I know there's a because of the smaller. I think it's this smaller um, vasculature and things. But I, remember, I know there's a classic thing they talk about, and this is air temperature now. That in the states, anyway, if if they've got these freezing mornings and there's snow on your car and you start sort of shoveling off the snow um, with the, you know these all these businessmen or whatever on the way to work have heart attacks because they're using their, their these arms, small arms. You've got vasoconstriction, so reduce blood flow because of the cold. And it can put up your blood pressure. And as you, as you said earlier, if you've got an underlying heart condition, mm. uh, you could sort of keel over. <clears throat> yeah, no, no, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, you definitely get a higher cardiovascular response to arm exercise. Uh, the classic being, you know, trying to screw something into the ceiling above your head, you know, is a is, is really good way of getting a very high heart rate um, and, and blood pressure response. So there's certainly that for... I mean, you know, for somebody swimming, it's simply that the, the arms just cool more quickly to the, there's a, there's a muscle temperature, which is about 27 degrees Celsius. And around about 27 degrees Celsius, you've got the reduction in enzyme activity, ATP, um, a rate of utilization, um, ACH, calcium release and uptake, all of these things, muscle perfusion, uh, slower rates of diffusion, slower um, action potential um, transmission, um, rates of conduction, increased vis viscosity, decreased elasticity in, in the joint. I mean, there's just a whole host of things that occur mm -hmm. as deep body, as th that local temperature rather cool. And those reductions um, lead to that physical in, in, incapacitation at a, at a muscle temperature of about 27. And remember muscles want to be active when they're active, want to be up at around about 40 plus degrees Celsius. So 
this is quite a long way below that. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we start to see uh, that physical incapacitation, which, I mean, it, it is to the point of not being able to swim. So you've gone from somebody who can swim pretty comfortably easily within 20 or 30 minutes is now struggling and we've done that test with olympic gold medal breaststrokers in a swimming flume in sweden and okay that took a bit longer that took about um 50 minutes but by 50 minutes with a normal core temperature still um this guy was uh one third the efficiency in terms of the distance he could swim for a lot for the uh, one liter of oxygen consumed as he had been at the start and wow. if you'd have asked him, he, he'd lost his um, uh, proprioceptive feedback. He had no idea where his limbs were in space. He was, his, his um, stroke was completely uncoordinated and the force he was generated had plummeted. So, you know, I, uh, now that, that's one of the things that can happen in air as well as water. One of the reasons for looking at it in water is it just happens more quickly um uh, and it's going to happen more frequently because often in air you can balance your heat loss with your heat production because your heat loss is relatively less than in water so yeah. that guy was <laughs> swimming so despite contracting all the muscles his muscles they would have dropped to this 27 because you know normally yeah. i think muscle normally is like about 30 so if your body temperature is 37 the muscle is usually about 35 or 36 and then when you start exercise it'll easily as you said increase to 38, 39, 40. But you're saying yeah. swimming in cold water, this 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 Olympic champion or whatever you said he was, yeah. his muscles would have dropped to 27 or something. Is that what you think? Yeah, yeah. So, so certainly um in the in his extremities, particularly in his arms, you'll get a cold-induced um vasoconstriction, not only to the skin, but also in the muscle that overrides the hyperemic response from the performance of exercise. So one of the other things that happens is you switch to anaerobic metabolism sooner. Uh, you increase the amount because of Because there's oxygen speed. delivery? Or... Yeah, exactly, because yeah, the blood okay. flow is com compromised. And so classically what you see in somebody exercising in a cold environment is they're at submaximal levels of exercise. They will have a higher oxygen consumption because they're getting the superimposition of shivering on muscle function up until... That gets that gets kind of overridden at around about an oxygen consumption of one to one and a half liters per minute. So you'll see an increased oxygen consumption at low intensity exercise because of this superimposition. You'll see a lower maximum ability in terms of your aerobic um, consumption, but you'll also see a very much earlier switch to anaerobic metabolism because of so compromised blood flow. Wow. So higher lactate and higher oxygen consumption. Well, that's interesting. Now, what do we talk? We've talked a little bit about exercise in the uh, in cold. So water temperature limits triathlon and marathon swimming. So are, are there actually water? I mean, I always think about people swimming across the English Channel. I've actually got a very good friend I went to high school with. His son was the fastest across the English Channel a few years ago at 16, Ned Whelan. Mm -hmm um how do they actually do that and, and is, is there i know they put on um yeah why don't you tell me what they do they rub on various things lanolin mostly wool fat wool fat so yeah i mean if you go back far enough i mean in the 1950s there were races across the channel and the guy who was winning a lot of them was a guy called jason zerganos and jason zerganos was uh, investigated by Griff Pugh. Um, those who haven't heard of Griff Pugh should go and read The First Ascent of Everest by Harriet Tukey. It's a fantastic book for anybody interested in these kind of areas. Uh, and Griff Pugh basically got Hillary and Tensing to the top of Everest, although he wasn't, mm. he wasn't recognised for it at the time because the British approach to such things was you had to do it without the assistance of boffins. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a good read. Griff Pugh also looked at hypothermia in air uh, on the four inns walk and the deaths that occurred there. And he looked at uh, why somebody like Jason Zerganos could swim the channel, taking longer than the average estimated survival time of people from the Second World War, which is basically one hour at five, two hours at 10, six hours at 15 degrees Celsius. 
And he did the studies and they were remarkable studies, really. They're really interesting to read uh, in the way they're written as much as anything. Uh, and what he found was that the open water swimmers had a combination of fitness and fatness. So they were able to swim fast, produce a lot of heat, and they had sufficient um, insulation to conserve that heat. Um, and there was a move towards thinner open water swimmers, but, the, but they tended still to have a reasonable amount of body fat and were fast. So if you look at uh, open water swimmers now, you'll see... Um, you know, you'll see fat, fast swimmers and you'll see fat, slow swimmers and you'll see fast, thin swimmers. What you won't see is slow, thin swimmers. They tend to not be swimming across the channel. Uh, and there is some evidence that there's, a, there's also um, a physiological adaptation, an insulative ad adaptation where you actually increase the amount of insulation by decreasing the amount of blood flow to the um, extremities when, you, when people are repeatedly swimming. In, um, in cold water. So there are some adaptations that occur in addition to just the loss of the cold shock response. Um, incidentally, the dangerous one that occurs is um, with repeated exposure to cold water, you, you, you lose your sensation of cold. So when you first go in, it feels horrible and you want to get out, the behavioral drive is to get out. When you've been doing it for some time, all of a sudden, you don't get that big cold shock response. It feels comfortable. Um, and actually, when Pew was doing the studies using himself as a control, sitting in a cold tank, shivering like mad, moaning in a fetal position, um, next to him, Jason Zerganos was reading a newspaper and asked for his pipe. So uh, that's the extent to which you can become comfortable. It ended up being his downfall, unfortunately, because as he tried, Jason Zerganos tried to swim between um, Ireland and Scotland within about a mile or two of the Scottish coast um, he died from hypothermia having not at any time he went into um, ventricular fibrillation at no time had he felt cold so you know sometimes how we feel about things is really important for us because it drives our behavioral thermoregulatory system which is the most powerful system the reason we're not all still living around the equator is not because we've got particularly great physiology or morphology it's because we used our intellect to build things wear clothes and recreate next to the skin that tropical climate in which we evolved so anyone listening to this podcast that says they're feeling comfortable i'll wager a bet that their mean skin temperature is within half a degree of 33 degrees celsius which is what it would be if they were naked in 28 degree air yeah. Wow. But hang on. But I thought everyone's always ha has their thermometer now set. So it's 22 degrees plus or minus 0 0.1 or something the whole year mm -hmm. round. Yeah, but that's and because they they're not naked. That's comfortable. Yeah, because, because they're wearing they're not clothes. Naked. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want to just exactly. walk about in a pair of pants, um, you know, or, or very scantily dressed as we would have been, you know, centuries ago, then you need 28 degree air. Um, as you add clothing, then the air temperature can come down because you're now you're now controlling your average body temperature, skin temperature by the microclimate under the clothes. And that's remarkably consistent. Um, unfortunately, that intellectual path, technological path that we've chosen to go down, uh, which differs from pretty much every other species that have gone down more morphological adaptations and physiological adaptations, means that we're dependent on consuming the earth's resources in order to keep heating and cooling things mm -hmm. which is why we're where we're at where we're at with um, climate change exactly it used to drive me crazy i did my masters in the u.s and um in winter that have a have a the heating was cranked up so hot that they'd sometimes open the windows in the dorm and things like that i didn't stay in the dorm but i could have passed and then in summer, they'd have it so cold, you know, because it's like, oh, it's so nice getting back from being outside and being cold. And um, they actually had it switched so that, um, what was it? The temperature would be set um, hotter in winter and cooler in summer. So it's it sort of the exact opposite. So what do you think about yeah. that? We, we talked before we came on about heat shock proteins being activated by cold and hot. And, 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 that, and you were saying they should be called shock proteins. Um, and that that's actually favorable. You have favorable adaptations to being cold. You know, you have increases in brown fat, which can be, you know, have beneficial effects. And, and when it's 
uh, and you get the, and, and when it's hot, you get the heat shock proteins that can improve insulin sensitivity. What do you think about this concept of always keeping yourself, you know, just this perfect sort of so-called comfortable, but you're not really stressing your, you know, you're meant to stress your systems a little bit. Well, I agree. I mean, you've, you've, um, you, I, I absolutely agree. We've, we've become what I call thermostatic. So um, we've used technology at great expense to the planet to maintain our thermal comfort. Um, we don't, we rarely challenge our a whole host of our body's homeostatic systems. There, you know, there's a subtle difference you've got to make between yes, we're a homeostatic animal. Yes, we do well when we can maintain homeostasis. But in order to be able to do that effectively, we need to perturb the systems that enable that to happen. Uh, I, I, the analogy that most people are, will understand is, you know, um, is is skeletal muscle. Um, and the old, you know, adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. Well, that's fine. You know, if, if you want to just sit about all day and do nothing, then you'll get atrophy of the muscle. But when you come mm. to need it, it won't be there. And so you have to keep perturbing that system, stimulating that system, um, you know, uh, giving it a stimulus to maintain its function. And the same applies to the thermoregulatory system, to other systems of the body. But we've become so thermostatic uh, that we no longer get those perturbations from day-to-day -day life. And I think that's mm. partly, maybe unconsciously even, why people are doing things like taking up open water swimming and claiming it's transforming their lives. You know, it's uh, not only affecting their physical, it's also affecting their mental well-being. Um, unfortunately, that the research in that area is still in, in its infancy compared to the hazardous responses. But also you'll see, creeping into the clinical literature, um, you'll see things like um, um, hot baths for insulin sensitivity for type 2 diabetics. Mm -hmm. You'll see cold exposure for various things. So we're now having to reintroduce these perturbations through special interventions because they're just not happen happening naturally, which they did do when we were living you know, freely in, in a tropical environment. That's, that's really interesting. So I guess I've never thought about this before. So we know that we get adaptation to um, exercise in the cold and just being in the cold. You talked about how you get, you know, you adapt to that. And we know people do heat acclimation all the time when they're getting ready for a race, you know, that's going to be hot. But as part of that, just sort of getting back to the, the way you're meant to be. So so if you're not, if you're always living at 22 degrees Celsius, do you, does your body actually get uh, not as good? I guess it by definition it does. Yeah, and no, Responding exactly. to hot and responding to cold. What, yeah, we, no, what we, we call we, training we, is just getting it back to how, how it's meant to be almost. <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that we spend time doing is working with athletes to prepare them for cold and heat events, but particularly heat, because that's where the major sporting events, the Olympics, the soccer World Cups, et cetera, occur. So we've worked quite extensively with what was the English Institute of Sport, now UK um, Sports Institute, um, helping them prepare, for example, tri triathletes for Tokyo. I mean, there's been, there been a whole series of, of heat. And yes, um, people will acclimatize to heat. Um, generally, elite athletes, because they've done a lot of exercise and pushed their body temperatures up regularly and are not that thermostatic in comparison with the general population, will be able to adapt to heat more quickly than the average individual. So maybe seven rather than 14 days or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you still see an increase in output from the sweat glands. You see changes in aldosterone, you see salt retention, expansion of plasma volume, improved cardiovascular function um, and efficiency, sweat distribution changing, uh, comfort improving, glucose utilization falling. In fact, to the point mm -hmm. where acclimatization is now being suggested as a an ergogenic aid for even performance in thermoneutral environments or cool environments mm. because it's has you know, functional capaci capacity capacity mm. aspects. But the point is that um, you know even with elite athletes you have to do that because we're no longer living in hot environments that are hot during the day, cold overnight, mm. having to hunt and get very hot, shivering because of cold, you know, and adapting to the heat and adapting to the cold, which we were doing 
just on a day-to-day -day basis through natural living when we were in a sort of tropical savanna and then desert type environment. Um, but the bigger problem, of course, is, is with the general population because, <clears throat> you know, with the, we, we, we have a problem with sedentary lifestyles compounded by that sedentary lifestyle is compounded by the things we've been talking about, by, by about thermo, being thermostatic. And we've now got, you know, people living for longer, um, but the health span of people has not changed. It's about 64 for the UK. But we might have people now living, if you were born in 2016, you've got a one in three chance in the UK of living to 100. So we could end up with people unhealthy for, um, you know, 37 years. years. Um, and, and the drain that that will put on the National Health Service. And a lot of these illnesses are avoidable. They're lifestyle illnesses, Com mm. a combination of sedentary behaviour and a lack of perturbation to the thermoregulator or to you know the, the basic physiological systems of the body and we, we need to do something about that well this is really fascinating i've been thinking well, just <clears> i was <throat> thinking the fact that we with thermostatic as you say that you know, most people are, are not really i guess people that exercise are, as you said are, are going to be getting these stimulus stimuli and not be so thermostatic people that don't exercise and and that are always sort of you know comfortable and wearing clothes and not sorry wearing an amount of clothes, they're not cold or they're not hot. Are they actually more likely? So some of them, some of the, oh, what am I trying to say? So if you went back 100 years ago, years and people didn't have central heating and they were used to being cold and things like that in winter, and then they fell on the water, would they be less likely to have this, this gasping and all that because they'd be kind of more used to feeling cold? You know, it's not such a shock to the system to go from perfectly thermostatic to suddenly, shit, I'm in, I'm in a bugger, I'm in <clears> cold water. Well, I think there's no doubt that um, people were probably more robust and more resilient uh, in the days where they spent quite a lot of their time getting hot and cold. Um, there are plenty, however, um, reports from 100 years ago of people dying on immersion in cold water. And, you know, so I think that level of stimulus is so high that it probably swamps pretty much Overright. any yeah, any yeah. natural, you know, adaptation. But where we'll see it more subtly is with ongoing climate change. Um, mm. And, you know, as, as we go further, I mean, it's obviously started, but as we go further and further and we get, um, we're now getting heat waves that are, four degrees warmer they're, they're so they're more intense they're more frequent they're longer lasting longer um we're going to start to see that lack of resilience um reflected in the number of problems we have associated with that um so i you know i think that uh, there's lots of good reasons for trying to, and i know you know it's not like it's not happening there's an enormous drive in many public health campaigns around the world to try and get people active um but you know there's an argument for also getting them used to getting back used to being involved in being hot being cold you know being hungry being fed um exercising and all these different aspects where that you start to build up these perturbations and and the resilience that follows fantastic all right we've taken a lot of, a lot of your time do you have a bit more time at all to talk about uh, a couple of other bits and pieces sure yeah okay so i wanted to ask about um you sent me a dot point about cross adaptation between cold and altitude so that's something we would be interested to hear about yeah so um one of the criticisms um that i would level at our area of extreme environmental physiology is we're very siloed and I think that's probably the same. I mean, that's just a function of the education system where you learn more and more about less and less until you know, you know everything there is to know about not very much. Um, <clears throat> but um, certainly, I mean, I've always been regarded as sort of cold, wet and nasty. Um, other friends I have are regarded as, you know, um, hot and sweaty. Uh, and others are sort of high altitude people. But of course, that's not the way the natural environment is. If you send somebody out into a desert, they're likely to get very hot during the day and very cold overnight. If you send them mm -hmm. up a mountain, they're likely to have the combined stresses of, of heat and cold. 
And so um, I th I'm just, it was about 2012, I, I did a little bit of a, uh, an analysis with a colleague, Heather, Heather Massey, um, about how many papers that had been published that were um, looked at more than one stressor. And it was literally mm. a handful. I mean, there was hardly anything done. And we kind of, and then in, in, in that editorial, encouraged people to start looking at this cross adaptation. So that's that comes in different forms. That's not just um, looking at, you know, what happens if I go into the cold and now I go into the cold and I'm hypoxic. Um, but it's also, well, what about if I adapt to cold by repeated cold exposures? What does that do to my response to altitude? Is there a degree to which at a systemic level there is a, a common, you know, a common change? Mm -hmm. And I'm pleased to say there's been lots of work done now. And, um, you know, <clears throat> not, not all by us, of course, by uh, some excellent work being done on, on, on some of the cellular changes that you see. And there's increasing evidence that um, there is cross adaptation. So we did a study where we got people to become habituated to the cold shock response with repeated exposures to cold. And that improved their function at altitude uh, with exercise mm. at altitude. Now, obviously, some of the adaptations you get are specific to the, to the stimulus. So heat with sweat gland function, um, red blood cell numbers, altitude, uh, attenuation of cold shock with cold water, etc. But also some of them are more generic in terms of altering the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system that we've talked about. Um, the release of various, let's call them shock proteins, whether they be heat or cold and the way they underpin things. So there's now um, a fairly robust area looking at cross adaptation, coincidental stimulation, um, that I think is probably a really important area for the future. So we did a study uh, with uh, colleagues, Claire Eglin and, and, and Heather and others, Heather Massey and others looking at um, your susceptibility to peripheral cold injury when with cold, but with cold plus hypoxia. And with cold plus hypoxia, your essentially dose of cold increases. So you're more likely to get a cold injury, for example. So yeah, I, as I say, it's a it's a um I think an important area that warrants further study. Yeah, and it sort of links in with what you said earlier as well that um heat acclimation can improve your exercise in thermoneutral as well because you know as you said you get increases in plasma volume and and um <coughs> sweating earlier and, and all those things are good Lars, Lars Nemo was on a few weeks ago and he mentioned something like that as well yeah all right so that's very interesting hmm. and okay yeah, so, so what about uh -huh, sorry you go yeah. no 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 just to say yeah I mean there's there's different combinations that you can have um you know, uh, you know, there's a whole host of combinations you can have but in, in terms of heat and cold and cold and altitude and altitude and heat. But some of these changes are some of these changes are quite important. So, you know, the kind of remodeling you see when you get make people hypoxic and then their response to uh, their response of, you know, cardiac rehabilitation, for example. So I think I think it's really still in its mm -hmm. infancy uh, in terms of the different the different areas that you can look at, you know, adaptation to one stimulus providing cross tolerance to another, e.g. heat acclimatization, hypoxia, adaptation to one stimulus enhancing an adaptation to another, um, you know, adaptation to one stimulus plus adaptation to another stimulus. So we know that heat adaptation plus exercise can increase um, cardiac protection this is a it's a really interesting area that um i hope gets explored uh further yeah i had gregoire mele i think so you say his name uh altitude uh guy and he he, he also he was on the podcast and he was talking about some of the stuff with hypoxic stimuli to look at cardiovascular system which I yeah. think you were talking about. um yeah so that's very interesting and it might be you know, you talked talk about thermostatic, but the fact that so many people are just static, static, like with, you know, you've got your immune system's not getting stimulated because everything's so clean and you're not getting hot and cold and you're not exercising, or whatever. Maybe just stimulating anything 
is, is good because at least your body, you know, <coughs> maybe it's so, then crossing over to something else. So the interesting thing about the claims being made for open water swimming and cold water dipping um, actually center in three areas. One is um, doing this wakes you up. Well, that's not a surprise. That's the cold shock response. That's the release of stress hormones. That's adrenaline, noradrenaline, or cortisol, et cetera, et cetera. The other is that um, it improves your immune system. And the evidence is still, uh, the jury is rather still out with regard to that evidence. But it does seem that actually fairly short cold exposures um, may prime the immune system. Longer exposures may impair it. Uh, and there's also, a, a, you know, an improvement reported in conditions that have some form of inflammatory component. And we know that you know, cold water exposure is anti-inflammatory. Um, but the interesting thing is the same thing that we've been talking about as being a major hazard on, on immersion, the cold shock response, also seems to be the response that's prompting most of these beneficial changes. So it's another good example of the twin edged sword of cold, you know, where on the one side it's causing something like cold shock is it, it, accounting for 60 percent of the deaths we see in cold water immersion. But on the other side, it may be that that sudden neurophysiological and hormonal response that you see in the first seconds of immersion is actually actually promoting some beneficial responses. The problem is the definitive studies just haven't been done in that area yet, but that's another area for any young person listening in who's looking for a, mm. a job for life in terms of it's research. Almost, There's tons of stuff to be done in that area. It's almost the definition of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I guess. Yes, the sort of hormesis response of, uh, that we see in many different areas. All right, now this one I think is, um, you know, we can't sort of talk about cold and exercise and not talk about pre-cooling and things like that, I guess. And I don't know, it's, it's pretty, it probably makes sense. I don't know if there's a whole lot to talk about, but, you know, we see the people before the Tour de France, they've got the ice vests on, you know, people jumping in cold water to, to um, before exercise in the heat to delay the increase in body, to, you know, be, to delay the time that it takes for the body temperature to get to that sort of critically hot level. Is there anything to talk about around that? Is there, it seems like a probably sensible thing to do. Is there any sort of downside to that or? Well, the only thing I would encourage people to do is that we pride ourselves, you know, working in human physiology at whatever level, um, <clears throat> whether it's cellular or, you know, whole body that, you know, we, we say oh, we're an integrative uh, animal, integrative physiolog physiological um, uh, responses, um, but we tend to abandon those occasionally. So, I mean, my take on pre-cooling is, um, firstly, I mean, if you're going to add heat to, uh, and quite a lot of people look at things from a, mechan from a sort of engineering mechanistic point of view. So they say, yeah, if you cool something and then you add heat to it, it'll take longer to get to where it where it becomes impaired well of course yeah okay but if you're but also if you're gaining heat also from the environment then the temperature difference is greater once you've lowered the temperature a bit so so you'll find that you know just through newtonian rules these two temperatures will come together um okay we can i mean you can debate that till the cows come home with with pre-cooling and how long it's going to take and etc and also for something like the tour de france where you're exercising for four and a half hours um yeah, it's true. what difference is that going to make um it, if you're going to exercise for 15 minutes then i think there's maybe more of a, a an argument but even then i'd be interested mm. to see particularly if it's a hot air environment the thing that we miss out on all of this is what actually does pre-cooling do to you? Well, one of the things people, athletes, are really keen to get right is their, is their fluid balance. Because they know, particularly if they're going to go and exercise in a hot environment, mm -hmm. and having as much fluid on board as possible. Now, the mm -hmm. first thing that's going to happen if I pre-cool, I'm going to get a cold-induced diuresis. And I can tell mm -hmm. you that um, putting somebody into a cold environment, cold water, ice jacket, something like that, can produce around about a half to three quarters of a liter of urine mm -hmm. in about 30 to 45 minutes. So okay. where's the consideration for fluid balance? So I now start the event. I might be half a degree cooler, but I'm a half a liter lighter in terms of my circulating blood volume. 
So, mm. um, and yet, but when I went, when I went, of course, when I weigh my body, it will be the same, but it's just that the fluids move from one Excellent. area to mm. another. So I just think we need to be a little bit more mm. uh, integrative you and are. holistic in the yeah. way we view some of these things. That's a good point. Now, okay, and then and then they finish the Tour de France. Oh, God, I mean, we just said the Tour de France. So they finish the stage, and then on come the ice fests again while they're cooling down, um, which is sort of well, it's not overly. It's it's kind of a weird one because they're hot and they're cycling, um, but they want to cool down. And they want to cool down quickly. But again, I guess you'd say, well, how much difference does that make? And they've got you know about eighteen hours until the next event. Does it matter how quickly they cool down after being hot? Well, yeah, I, I, again, uh, it depends on what you're after. If you want mm. to cool the body down and you've still got a viable circulation, the best way to do it is to allow the physiology of the body to deliver the heat to the surface of the skin. And then you take that heat away at the greatest rate you can without affecting blood flow to the skin. So mm. we've done studies, people can look them up, where we've compared ice vests with air air circulated versus with my colleague dr martin barwood um, and what you find is those techniques that allow the body to still thermoregulate i.e fanning hand immersion in cold water cool much more quickly than an ice vest because of course the mm -hmm. first thing if you cover that amount of the surface area of the body with an ice mm -hmm. vest the first thing the body is going to do even though it's hot um because there's a there's a relationship i mean again it comes back to knowing your physiology core temperature predominates in terms of a peripheral blood flow so it's about three or four times more important in terms of a change in temperature um as skin temperature however um if you put lots of the skin uh in a cold situation then that will cause a vasoconstriction and what you're then mm. going to do is instead of having the heat delivered to the surface of the skin oh, by by mass mm. flow you've now got to drag it out by conduction and that takes time it takes time to set up that conductive pathway um, and once you set it up it's fine it works but much less stressful much less clamping of heat in the body if you take the heat out as it arrives at the skin and that means immerse a small percentage of the surface area of the body the hands are very good you can lose more heat from the hands than you can from an ice vest and more quickly it starts working immediately as does whole body fanning starts working immediately whereas these other things take time take 10 15 20 minutes to set up the cooling gradient that's needed so the the argument if you want to remove heat from the body quickly then don't use those systems that don't use the physiology of the body use the physiology of the body to deliver that heat and take it away so the best temperature and well, this could be a tepid shower as well is the lowest temperature you can get the skin or bits of the skin without compromising peripheral blood flow. And that's why hand immersion works so good because it's a big surface area to mass ratio, but actually it's a relatively small part of the overall temperature of the body, of the skin of the body. So the, the body keeps sending heat into the hands. Um, now, there might be other reasons why you want to put people into water in terms of directly cooling muscles to decrease you know swelling and inflammation and you know blah 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 but i i i i'm not prepared to accept the argument that it's quicker to do it that way because we know we introduced um my colleague jim house and uh and our team introduced hand cooling into the royal navy that was then taken by british cycling and i've got nice pictures of chris hoy and so chris hoy and so bradley wiggins sitting there with their hands in cold water using hand cooling to cool their body temperature down uh, the um you know the, so you know that's again taking the basic understanding of thermal physiology physiology of the body and then applying it to a practical scenario so you you'd suggest therefore and it sounds like that you've already had um these two two sirs now <laughs> uh, yeah. is it chris hoy and um, um bradley wiggins bradley wiggins of course who won the tour de france <clears throat> and Chris Hoy won a whole bunch of uh, gold medals. So mm. you've actually had them. So exercising the heat, and they would finish and put their hands in cold water. Oh yeah, no, and they used it uh, at Olympics. So I've got pictures of them at the relative, you know, relevant Olympics, where they would do a warm up, 
Um, so they wanted to get muscle temperature up and activated, but then they wanted a lower body temperature generally uh, and just okay. five or 10 minutes of hand immersion. And the other nice thing about, for example, hand immersion is it's self-limiting because as soon as you get the body temperature down towards normal, the hands will vasoconstrict and they'll start to feel cold. So as soon as your hands no longer feel oh, comfortable oh. in the cold mm. water, it's time to stop. Um, I mean, they say that um, there was a psychological advantage as well, because one of their major competitors saw them sitting there on these chairs with their hands in plastic bags and went out and got exactly the same stuff. But they hadn't noticed there was cold water in the plastic bags, So they just sat with their hands in plastic, sweating. which were <laughs> sweating yeah. away. And there was a tremendous psychological advantage to the to the GB team. But, you know, I, it's uh, but, okay. but the most important thing is that, you know, think about the physiology, whether it be the vasoconstriction and cold diuresis you're using, you're causing prior to prolonged exp ex um, exercise in the heat or how to cool a body. Oh, OK, so this has been great. Um, OK, so how about we just finish up talking about ice baths? So you, you sort of touched on it. So. <laughs> People, you know, going to the gym or doing doing a cycling race or whatever, and then it's like, right, I've got to cool my my whole body down by jumping into freezing cold water. And I've seen indications here and there that that actually may reduce ad some adaptations to to exercise training as well. So, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's I have to say it's not particularly our area. My mm -hmm. my concern when I see that, in, the questions I ask is. Uh, let's have a look at these the studies and how well controlled they were because when you it's a bit like the story of going open water swimming there's several other things going on so you're climbing into water so you've got a hydrostatic effect you've got a reduction in gravity effect um, okay um, so do we know if this works I mean everything I've told you thus far suggests that you know you're going to get the maximum cold shock response in between 15 and 10 degrees does it need to be ice water my problem with ice water is there's a condition called non-freezing cold injury that most people have never heard of um and i include in that lots of people who are going and putting themselves in situations where they could get it so we've all heard of freezing cold injury frostbite because that's the sexy thing where bits get chopped off you or fall off non-freezing cold injury is where the tissues don't freeze but they are cooled for severely enough or for long enough to have to damage the microvasculature and the small fibers in particularly the extremities. So this is classically a hand and feet problem. Uh, and the consequences of that are um, cold sensitivity in that area. So you get cold very quickly when you go into a cool environment, which increases your chances of a more serious injury. It's uh, um, hyperhidrosis. So that area begins to sweat which makes you more prone to cooling and pain. Now, um, I really wouldn't advocate anybody going into ice cold water, um, not just from the health perspective of the potential dangers of that, but just from the, from the peripheral neurovascular neuropathy um, perspective mm -hmm. as well. And until such times as somebody can clearly demonstrate to me that um, cooling by going into 10 or 12 degree water or 15 degree water is significantly inferior to going into ice baths, then uh, I will reserve my judgment, I'm afraid, because I'm, I'm slightly concerned that these people are doing damage that they haven't even recognised at this stage. Yeah, and again, like you said, the body, the body sort of knows what it's doing. Um, you know, so in terms of putting ice vests on, you're better, not, better off not doing that. You think jumping into ice cold baths, and sometimes they are actually ice mm. in there. Your body pretty much tells you to not do that. Yeah, I mean, I I, as I say, I, but I mean, unfortunately, again, it's a bit like people are only considering the narrow, mm -hmm. blinkered aspect that they want to, which is, oh, we've got to get the muscle temperature down, or we've got to get this down. What they're not thinking about, well, actually, what are we doing to the microcirculation in the toes? Mm. What are we doing to the mm. microcirculation in the fingers? How comes these guys, there are so many guys with, um, you know, non-freezing cold injury from people who do from mountaineers to people sleeping rough to the military. How's that happening? How did that? Well, it occurred because they spent, you know, we uh, with the trouble with non-freezing cold injury, to be absolutely honest, and we've just published three papers on it in experimental physiology, is we still don't really know the um, 
the uh, cause of it, the dose of cold you need, and the pathology of it. But we do know that there is a, it, you know, it, there's a, there's a, a temperature duration combination dose mm. of cold that can produce something which you can have for the rest of your life. When I first went to the Institute of Naval Medicine and we had a cold injuries clinic there, we were examining people who had picked up their cold injuries nearly 50 years be before, and they were mm. still struggling with that condition. So I don't mind, yeah, before, but before you decide to go and do things like ice cold immersions, for whatever reason, just make sure you understand the risks as well as the benefits and make sure on your, under your heading of risks, you learn a little bit about non-freezing cold injury. Um, just to qualify everything I've said thus far, everything I've said thus far is, is with, with, in terms of cooling and when would you put people into cold water, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, um, that, everything we've said depends on a normal peripheral circulation. If you get somebody who's got heat stroke, who now has a core temperature of over, you know, well over 40 degrees um, and has had a collapse in their peripheral blood flow, there is very little alternative in terms of getting heat out of the body if it's not being delivered to the surface of the skin um, other than putting them into cold water and dragging it out by conduction. But actually for the kind of people that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. otherwise fit, healthy individuals who are just exercising in a hot environment, then apply physiological principles beautiful all right so thank you very much for this i wonder if we can um uh, have some takeaway messages from from all this a few sort of things that you want people to take away from this um, well i guess I, I okay so takeaway messages number one um understand as much as you can of the physiology and pathophysiology mm -hmm. of the areas that you're working in and what you're trying to do, whether that be with an, an elite athlete or with you know a, 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 any other group really, um, because an understanding of that will help you make decisions in unique scenarios because you can apply those principles and come up with an answer. Um, number two, um, I guess, is to make sure that with the increasing amount of information that's available out there, it's really easy to be misled by people who don't really know what they're talking about. Um, and so the first thing I always do before I listen to what somebody's got to say, I check how many publications they've got in the area that they're, they're pontificating about. Um, and number three is, um, I guess, make sure where you can, you apply your work. And if, it is, if it's applicable to elite, sports people or if it's applicable to other users fire and rescue service lifeguards lifeboats then get involved with them and write articles for their magazines and their because that's where you'll see your work applied um number i guess no i won't be up to number four be an advocate mm -hmm. for people remaining physically active and perturbing mm -hmm. their homeostatic systems uh number five is enjoy your science and work with as many decent people as you can because that's where the fun really comes from right and and if the if the person listening is not a science uh studied person or whatever they should they should get their advice as you said from mm -hmm. people that know that they're talking about and don't just sort of jump in ice baths and whatever else without if they don't know what they're doing it and why you know talk yeah, no, to someone no, like you that actually explains it mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, you remember, Glenn, when we were young men, that if you wanted to find out about anything, you put, you went to the library, you went to a book called Index Medicus, which had all the front pages of yes. all the journals in, that were part, and you'd mm -hmm. put in a library loan, and about two weeks later, this paper would turn up, mm -hmm. and you would be reading it avidly. Now, if I mm -hmm. want to find out about something, I just Google it, and within seconds, I'll have pages and pages of stuff. What I don't have is any index of what's right and what's wrong of what the people who have written that stuff actually know is it that they've just been you know they've been for one run and now they're going to write a, 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 a podcast on running um so it's we need to be careful about where we get our information from and one of the things we need to teach people and i include in that the general public is you know having some uh ability to think critically and mm. make sure that you don't just accept everything that's thrown at you because we get so much thrown at us now and so 
and so much of it is is poor quality poorly evidenced uh so you know as i say we need we need to be uh have a bit more rigor about the way we get our um obtain our information exactly and and then by what people watching inside exercise at least they've got <laughs> you know they've got people that have published lots of papers in the area they should still be skeptical and still sort of question things but at least you know they're getting it from an expert rather than some random on social media or something and and go to more than one expert you know, right. because, you know, you wouldn't go and, you know, get a house built with one quotation. So don't make a decision based on one quotation. There's more than one. And particularly if you find out they're having a look through that people disagree with each other, because sometimes the disagreement Good. is purely down to, um, you know, a different question being addressed. And we've just been talking about cold immersion, for example, in terms of athletic performance. So I don't know. Yeah, I just I just. Uh, we need to we need to teach critical analytical thought to people, um, and, and so that when they leave school, they can apply that critical analytical thought to the kind of information that gets presented to them across the board, not just from exercise studies. Fantastic. Well, lots of great information there, a bit of philosophy as well, and uh, so thank you again for coming on late, late notice. Really enjoy the My chat. My pleasure. Thank and, you for the invitation. Uh, here will be up online. Okay, great. I'll put it up online right. and let you know. See ya. Okay, Glenn, all the best. Have a good holiday. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.